important. you say that? I'm an important person. Is so what, so what do you what means. are you guys going on guy going on and on it these days? What's new in the well, on it? Directing, on it line? I'm directing optimization. So what, what's cool is I get to fucking guinea pig. Here's what let me translate what that means. I'm really the director of human guinea pig. So anything that has a potential for accelerating fucking gains in all aspects of life, <laughs> mentally, emotionally, <laughs> physically, and spiritually, I get to try. And uh, on it pays for it, and I get to fucking try it out. So I've been running this. Something we didn't talk about on the podcast was the transcranial direct current stimulation, which Dr. Dan Engel talks about in his book, uh, The Concussion Repair Manual. Phenomenal device, only 150 bucks. Apex device. It's not a fucking. It's not a sponsor of the show. But I'm just saying, excellent way to hack consciousness. I've been doing it with Duolingo, learning Spanish for free. Okay. You can do it on a fucking Indo board and have increased balance. Uh, fuck, man, we could talk five minutes about that thing. But bottom line is, I get to try cool shit. Uh, working on new products, food products as well. So not just supplements, but working with product development has really tickled my creativity bone here at Onnit. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, running the Onnit podcast has been excellent. We've had phenomenal guests in town like Paul Check, Mike Salemi. Uh, we just had my man Mark Bell in town. That'll release shortly into the new year. Mark Bell dropped fucking fire on the podcast. Dude, Mark Bell's a great guy. Incredible He's been on the show before too. Yeah, man. So, what new products have you guys got rolling out? Oh, uh, that's I got in trouble for that actually. No, not okay. new no, things that are already out. Sorry, things that are already public knowledge. Don't, I'm not asking you to spell any secrets. Got, but at the end of the day, trouble. I got in trouble for dropping some knowledge on shit that's we, not out yet. We got some monitor.com slash monkey fans out there that might want to buy some shit going in 2018, get themselves optimized. Yeah, man. Uh, I'll tell you right now, we revamped our um, spirulina chlorella, which is one that kind of goes under the radar. People are like, well, why the fuck should I take that? You know, I eat salad. I do this. I do that. But we don't need enough vegetables. I don't fucking need enough vegetables. And no, this almost money. all the shit that I eat is vegetables with fat and a bit of protein in the ketogenic diet. But from a detoxification standpoint, clearing out heavy metals, nasty pollutants and shit that we're bombarded with on a daily basis... There's a lot of things you can do to detox that are fucking not easy, but taking some capsules of organic spirulina and organic chlorella not only give you energy and make you feel better, but they help you fucking detox and eliminate a lot of nasty shit that we're dealing with. Fuck yeah. And that just improves cognitive function on a different pathway. Obviously, everyone knows about alpha brain, but I think spirulina chlorella is a fucking game changer. And now it's in capsule form instead of tablet. So... You, that means you get it's, it's a bit more bioavailable. You get a lot more of the nutrients in there, and uh, that's that's my fucking product right now. I'm Boom. rocking that. Love it. That is an ad, ladies and gentlemen. That is an ad, and as an, <laughs> as an, as I should mention, as an employee of Onnit and director of human optimization for Onnit, uh, what is that? I condone this message. No, you it's not. I endorse condone. this. Message. I endorse this message I endorse, on spirulina I, chlorella. I think you should go to onnit.com slash monkey, and you're going to get ten percent off. That's that right. Sweet, sweet goodness and detoxify the fuck and up out of your at body. At a fucking great price, son. So you're not going to be breaking the bank to buy it. Stock up on two or three bottles. You're going to go through it quickly. Bam. Now enjoy this show with Kyle. It's a fucking good one. I'm pumped, man. You pumped? You I'm ready pumped for every it? Every time I get to fucking sit down Dude, with my. Dude, you are a play. pleasure monkey in every sense of the word, my friend. I think you inspire me to be more of a pleasure monkey. To have more pleasure or more monkey. I don't know. I think it's a balance of, of both, right? <laughs> it's funny, man, because we talk about pleasure and it's like, it's it, there's, a, there's, a, there's such a balance with it where it comes down to understanding yourself, but not also just chasing the pleasures of the body and let them run the mind. Well, we should talk about that. Are we rolling yet? We are rolling. But you All need right. to get that mic a little closer to your face. Let, well, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to be mindful of where my lips go because I have a little beard right now <laughs> and I don't, I don't want the beard, this little lip action. I don't want the beard to touch. Yeah, I don't want the beard to, to to skim this microphone back and forth. That'll get real annoying real quick. Yeah, we're, like we're when, I inter- when I interviewed my boy Uriah Faber, he kept fucking touching the mic, and I was like, "Hey, grab grab that little piece that connects to the microphone." Yeah, that way you don't touch the microphone. <laughs> Didn't quite work out. <laughs> um, yeah, let's let's talk about pleasure here for a second. Okay. So we got this idea, and and we're gonna do this this year in review. This but year in review. We, the year in review of 2017, we're coming to a close. But, you know, when you think about pleasure, it, it there's there's the negative connotation of I'm only searching for pleasure in the now, right? Like uh, alcohol, I'm going to feel good right now and I'll pay for it later. Yeah. Or, or uh, I'm going to eat this 
piece of cheesecake or this whole fucking pizza and I'll feel really good eating it and I'm going to feel like shit later because I ate it, right? Guilt, whatever, the fucking after effects, inflammation, get, becoming a fat slob, whatever the fucking back, back into that story looks like, right? Yeah. Then you've got other forms of pleasure that don't have, that have immediate fucking gratification that don't have the negative back end. Uh, I guess sex could fall into that category on both, on both sides of the fence. If you've got, you know, the, the, if you're banging some girl that you really don't care about, and then you have the worst pillow talk of all time after, then there, that would fall in the first category. <laughs> but in the second category, if it's someone you truly care about and you're having an amazing time, there's just going to be positive after that, right? Yeah. You have great sex. You feel good. There's a neurochemical response. Body feels awesome after. And uh, pillow talk can be amazing. And then fucking sleep like a baby. Do it again the next day. But there's also this other part of pleasure. Okay. The pleasure where there's a little bit of sacrifice, where you bust your ass doing something that's a bit more difficult that pays dividends in the long run, right? Like a really hard workout that's just grueling and you fucking feel like dep depleted. You know, you feel good. There's the euphoria of lifting something heavy or, or grinding through some hard cardio. And then the euphoria passes and you fucking just turn into a vegetable for like three hours. <laughs> but over time, you have the pleasure of now having pushed yourself mentally, physically, and emotionally past what you thought you were capable of, right? Yeah. And I think that's really where you see the beauty in some of the harder experiences with psychedelics because it's not always like, like, like Rick Doblin said, people, people have these bad trips because they think they're going to take this substance and only experience euphoria and only experience pleasure and good. And then they deal with some hard shit and they don't want that and they're not prepared for it and they resist it. They don't surrender and let go. They fight it and then it becomes worse. Right. But if you're willing if you realize like, Hey, I could see some shit that I don't want to see. I may relive some past traumas and that's okay yeah. because I'll be better for it in the long run. Having gone through that and seen it with new eyes and shifted my perspective on it. Right. Then that total experience is pleasure because fucking down the road, you're way better from it. Right. You've you, a weight can be lifted off your chest. Some, some underlying triggers that you've had your whole fucking life. You've been carrying baggage. You can finally let go of it, and you don't respond in the same way to a, a trigger that you've had for the last twenty fucking years. Well, it really is just like fitness, right? Because when you when you acknowledge and you and you dive in and you put yourself in uncomfortable situations, and you do it with amount of self awareness, just like awareness of your fitness capacity and where you actually are, being objective with yourself, you broaden your capacity. In the in fitness, right? Just like yeah. training, hitting the hard cardio, lifting the weights, doing the recovery, all the necessary pieces to train your body physically. You can do that with your emotional and and your just sense of self. Mm -hmm. And when you when you add depth to that, then you add increase your capacity to feel and inc increase your capacity to feel to to, to experience. Yeah, you're not only more empathetic and compassionate towards others, but you're. You give yourself more leeway, too. Mm -hmm. You don't fucking beat yourself up over stupid shit. Like, you realize you're just a fucking human experiencing this thing <laughs> and figuring it all out for the first time. Yeah. I think I had that realization when um, when I became a dad a couple years ago. I was like, fuck, I'm, I'm 33. I just had a son, and I'm a kid raising a kid. Yeah. And then I thought about my parents, and I was like, fuck, man. My dad was the same age, and he was a kid raising a kid. My mom was nine years younger than my dad. She's still a fucking kid at 56. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Right? That puts shit in perspective. Then it's like, oh, okay. I can make mistakes and not fucking think it's the end of the world. Right? Yeah. And that's, I had this conversation yesterday, actually, where it's like, we don't really know what the fuck's going to happen. Like, you really don't. Like, you don't know how, how grateful you're going to be for that experience in the future. You really have to give yourself a little bit of credit for just being in it and being aware of it as it's going on and knowing when things are challenging and taking the best version of yourself that you can given the experience you've had up to that point into those circumstances and just taking them for all they're worth and then understanding the power that you have to create your life knowing knowing that it's going to be different than what you expect your expectations are going to get crushed good or bad sometimes but it will be it will be something and it will be there and it will be yours and that's that's fucking awesome it's liberating it's it's almost like taking more ownership of what you can create liberates your future 
hundred percent. And it's taken ownership over the failures too, right? Responsibility for everything that goes on in your life, whether it's your weight or your health or your job situation or anything, your fucking relationships, the more you own that, the more empowering it is. The less you own it, the more you give that out to this happened to me because so-and-so or or I have the fat gene, so now I'm fucking <laughs> obese. I got the fucking fat gene. I'm supposed to be type 2 diabetic and obese. Yeah. It's same with Aubrey. It's fucking both identical in our genetic, in our 23 and me. And I'm fucking, I haven't been over 10% body fat in probably a decade. You know, it's just, it's a fucking choice. It all is, but it's empowering to say like, I'm responsible for this and I can't eat like an asshole and get away with it. Some people can, I can't, not genetically. You yeah. Know? That's again, that, that comes down to self-awareness and it comes down to discipline. Exactly. Right? We were talking about that the other day. <laughs> fucking Jocko Willink, discipline equals freedom. Yep. Right. 100%. And that's another form of pleasure because you fucking toe the line and you make the correct choices that ultimately lead to happiness and a better quality of life at the end of the day, at the end of the month, at the end of the fucking year, at the end of 2017, I made some pretty fucking good hard decisions that have landed me in a good spot. And I think you've done the same, right? Yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely. And the thing about it was, it came down to, man, I had this moment, and, and I think one thing we, I really want to do on this show is go through those moments where things shifted. Mm-hmm. I, I think I, I brought, from 2016, I, I really, so many things happened in 2016 that were just, I was a victim of, of circumstances in my own mind. And I had been doing what I thought I was supposed to do on a path that I, th- and I had blinders on. I had blinders on the, all the opportunities. And going into 2017, I kind of opened up and I saw, I saw the good and, and the shadow of opening up. And I remember sitting and I was having a conversation about something that was pretty vulnerable. And it was, it, it goes something like someone saying to me, why can't you just get over this thing that happened? And the words that came out of my mouth really changed everything for me. And that, that those were, I resent myself for letting it happen. Mm. And when that came out of my mouth, it, that moment changed everything because I'm like, it was me. Yeah. It was me. Like I, I did that. I allowed it. I created by allowing it. I, I created it. And that was so different. That was a different, it was a whole shift in my mentality. And I took that and that turned into, wow, fuck, I do have the power to create, you know, being passive and letting things happen is, is creating in a way too. That's a decision. Yeah. No decision is you've still made a choice. Exactly. Right? And, and I had to learn that lesson. So there's gratitude in that piece too, which is something I could have held on to forever, but I take what I can from it and be like, wow, that's a, that's a tool in my toolbox now to go forward. And I've had, I mean, 2017 has been stacked with those. It's been fucking awesome. You know, oh, yeah. I'm, here, I'm here able to do this. I wouldn't have, I couldn't have January 1, 2017, couldn't have imagined I'm doing this right now and having, getting to have these conversations and these, the way that w- taking ownership has created the conversations and had helped me grow as an individual has been incredible. And I get to work with people, dude, like one-on-one without fitness being an excuse, not having to kind of hide my intentions. Cause even when I was in the fitness world, it was about, it was really about the people. Always the fitness was the excuse. I don't have any, there's no facade anymore. It's like, we're here. I'm here to fucking help people with my experience by sharing it and just living and being and being vulnerable and putting it out there. And that's fuck, man. That's, that's more alignment than I've ever felt in my life but it took all the other pieces to, to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, Chris Ryan was talking about something where like, uh, you know, you look back and, and, the it's almost a cop out to say, well, I wouldn't change. If you could change anything in your life, what would you change? And then the, it's, he says, it's almost a cop out to say, I wouldn't change anything because everything that's happened is what brought me here today. And I fucking love my life. Right. But that is not a cop out because it's fu- <laughs> if you fucking love where you're at, that's exactly what's necessary. Yeah. And all the shit that you go through, you look back in hindsight and you're like, man, that was the fucking greatest catalyst for growth. All the challenges brought you here. That's like the hard psychedelic ceremony. Like you, you don't get the perspective change without going back through with the fucking tough stuff. Yeah. You don't get to fucking grow without having some added stressor. And I've been relating it back to fitness. I've said this before on the on it podcast and when i was doing current space like you don't get stronger by just lifting the fucking bar every workout you got to add weight you got to add speed you got to change the dynamic and create new stress right and that's what life gives us new fucking stress 
no matter who you are, where you live, how old, how young, you always have new stress. Well, dude, I want to piggyback on that though, because we, we both kind of come from that fitness world is that there is a time though in life and in fitness to go back to the bar, to go back to the empty bar. Deload week, baby. I know, but you go back to that and it was like, I, you know, I was a pretty decent weightlifter, a snatch and clean and jerk. If you don't know what that is, it probably doesn't matter for you, but it's a very high skill movement. You've mastered the snatch. And well, people <laughs> mastered this. I was the boss of the snatch still am to this day. <laughs> um, no, but I would go back and it's like, well, well, I want to, I want to be as good as that at your, as you are, as you are. And I was like, dude, I was a sloppy mess coming in here, but I knew when I got to a point where I needed to reset and I would go back to the empty bar. And I would spend time on the empty bar. You're talking about going could, back to basics. I would say take a step back, maybe unlearn some things that you've learned, break some patterns, and then go forward. Okay. Go forward yeah. with less resistance outside of yourself. Yeah. I think that's that's an incredible tool you can extrapolate to anything. You know, when work's really hard and uh, there's a lot on the table, do as much as you can to deload. Do as much as you can to take weight off the bar. Yeah. Right. Focus on the controllable factors and do them well, and then take out all the fucking distractors that you have. You know, if you're if you're overworked at your job and you can't fight, you don't have any fucking me time. That doesn't mean it's time to watch to binge watch. You know, Stranger Things when you get off your fucking <laughs> off your work day. That's time to fucking get your me time. That's time to go for a walk in nature with no fucking sound in your ears. Just just listening to fucking birds and the fucking wind breeze, mm-hmm. you know? Like that's that's your time to unwind. Meditation, whatever the fuck it is that you dig as a meaningful practice for alone me personal time, that's got to be in the mix too. Yeah. You know? And that allows you to focus better on the other shit, like doing a good job at work, figuring out what you should eat at night, figuring out what you should fucking, what you should do fitness wise. And oftentimes when everything else is so high, you know, you've got so much shit going on at work or so much shit going on in your relationship and it's just fucking turmoil everywhere. It's okay to scale back on the other things that you can control, you know? You don't have to fucking crush it every day with a Metcon yeah, or, or try to max effort PR every fucking three you know every third day in the gym like no there's times to do relaxed easy bodybuilder training there's times to just fucking get in long walks and nose breathing runs and shit like that you know and just make it fun again well it is it's going back and i did this in fitness i do this in life too it's like i take a step back and i go challenge my i go like to go challenge my deepest beliefs like what if i what if i come to understand what do i really believe in what do i anchor in and I want to, I'm going to challenge those a little bit. I want to challenge those and see if they hold up. And if I can, if I need to make some adjustments there, because I feel like just in every type, when we, when we continually grow and I feel, I see this a lot in people is that they'll start to have breakthroughs and, and big breakthroughs, like just in your early psychedelic experiences. And you'll have these big realizations and you'll, and you'll start to make decisions based upon those. Um, and this is just in life and, and personal development in general. And sometimes it's great to take a step back and reflect on where you're at and how you got there and make maybe adjust some things and makes and streamline yourself a little bit. You know, like is, is this, is my approach to this really the best? What do I actually give a fuck about? Have I evolved past that now? Can I add some depth to that? Those things are super crucial. And that's, that's shit. That's why we're here sitting, just reflecting on 2017. I mean, yeah. Shit. And what can you, I think at the end of the year, a terrific time to think about what to remove. What do I need less of? What do I not want to fucking continue with? Yeah. Right. What, what thing got me, what has gotten me to this place that has served its purpose that is no longer necessary? Exactly. You know, it's a, it's a winter time is a fucking excellent time. Fucking nature does it. We're following in line with the circadian rhythm of the earth, of the <laughs> annual cycle. How do we fucking remove and weed out all the shit that no longer serves us? Yeah. This is the time of the year to do it. You know? Well, dude, what's what's uh, what's what's not serving you anymore? I mean, you've had a, we, we both had pretty crazy years, as we've, as we've both alluded to. But like, what do you what fat are you trimming right now? Man, well, you know, you know, talking about the things that that got us in a great spot, and then just from a from a diet, you know, I, I have to break it down into the into the four doctors, as Paul check <laughs> as Paul check puts it. I've, I've I've really been thinking in that structure has helped me. So for people that don't know, you know. I, Paul Check was on the On It podcast. We had a great interview. I followed him for years. Had read his his ebook, which he just printed. The last four doctors you'll ever need. 
And so he takes it from uh, Hippocrates and Hippocrates had three doctors. He added a fourth because of our modern sickness. But the three doctors were Dr. Quiet, your sleeping, your meditation, your me time. Uh, Dr. Diet, the food you put in your body. Dr. Happy, do you play? What is your life's purpose, your mission, right? And then uh, Dr. Uh, Movement was the one Paul added because, you know, back in ancient Greece, people fucking moved every day. They, even the fucking philosophers would walk and lecture yeah. their disciples or they'd stand on a soapbox in front of a large group and fucking move around. So we have to have Dr. Movement, right? But Dr. Movement isn't just how you crush it in the gym for an hour. It's, it's moving around. It's, I fucking added an Indo board to my, to my uh, standing desk <laughs> and I was reading Mark Sisson's uh, new ketogenic, <laughs> the ketogenic reset book while on the fucking Indo board. And it was awesome. It was fun. I was like, fuck, dude, I'm having fun. Yeah. I'm having a shit ton of fun right now while I'm at work learning new shit, you know? But I think, you know, if, if I look into those areas uh, and even just talking about ketosis, you know, I went balls deep into ketosis after firing or after <laughs> retiring, after firing, after <laughs> retiring uh, from the UFC and it helped my brain immensely, mm-hmm. helped my body. And I was fucking sung the gospel on Rogan's about it. And then you know, I did a 50k ultra on it and kind of fucked myself metabolically and, and ran into some real health issues with parasites and candida and just fucked up stuff. I've been working on for close to two years now and had not been in ketosis for like over a year. And then thanks to some recommendations from Ryan Frissinger, the cosmic animal, he had a great podcast on the paleo solution with Rob Wolf. Rob Wolf introduced me to him and, um, now I'm back into ketosis for the first time in a year and it feels fucking great. And again, thinking about like, you don't, there's no one right diet for everyone. There's no one right diet that you'll spend the rest of your life doing. And what I've talked to, spoken with Ryan and Rob Wolf about is that to eat, you know, to follow, and this is something I got in Colombia in an ayahuasca ceremony <laughs> to live in harmony with the earth, with the seasons. Right. So it makes sense to not eat carbohydrates in the yeah. winter time because they weren't available before shipping and refrigeration and, and fucking bananas coming in from Panama <laughs> year round. Right. Yeah. And my ancestry is not from the equator. So it makes sense for me to cut carbs three to four months a year. And then to go back to eating fucking berries and, and cyclical car, uh, ketogenic dieting outside of that, you know, and I think that gives me flexibility in knowing like there's a time and place for it and I can experience the joys of that, you know, the cognitive improvement, the lowered inflammation, the fat loss, the endurance, and then I can still fucking have my carbohydrates in the summertime mm-hmm. when they're available and shit like that. So mindset has changed around the food that I put into my body in a seasonal basis. And that's been a big one. Um, it's been liberating and freeing in a way. And it's also less dogmatic and we're all fucking dogmatic about food, myself <laughs> included, you know? Yeah. And, um, but then like the biggest one in 2017 has been my balance of Dr. Quiet to Dr. Movement. Diet's always been fairly good uh, in the past f- th- three years, I'd say. Um, and, and Dr. Happy, you know, really having a purpose. I feel great working on it. I love what we're doing here. I, I get to exercise a lot of creativity with product development and different things like that. And certainly, as you know, hosting a podcast, <laughs> there's a lot of creativity there and picking your guests and knowing like, who's the fucking next person I want to have a dope conversation with. Yeah. Let me get the author of this fucking great book that I find super interesting. Right. And let me learn from that guy. Let me fucking... Personally, I greedy, very greedily want that fucking wisdom for myself. I want to embody that fucking knowledge for yeah. me. And then you guys can listen in yeah. and we'll all share in the fucking wealth of the wisdom. Right. So that's, that's been an amazing thing, uh, just in the job changes that I've had. But really the biggest one in 2017 is finding that balance of, Hey, I'm not a professional athlete anymore. I probably don't need to fucking crush myself in the gym and think that that's going to solve all my issues of stress, all my issues of wanting, like, is the goal to be in the best shape of my life really necessary at 35 when I'm not competing? No. Is the goal to fucking walk around like Buddha or Jesus, like feeling fucking great and just enjoying the <laughs> shit out of life and my waking yeah. consciousness and having a lower baseline stress. Is that goal more important? Fuck yeah. It's way more important to me now. So implementing 
a shit ton of different types of meditation practice has been, has been incredibly helpful for me. Uh, reading the science of mindfulness on um, Audible's great courses by Dr. Oh, Ronald Thanks Siegel. for referring me to that. That's yeah, fantastic. Brother. It's a fucking great one, you know? Like learning how to be mindful while I'm driving the car, while I'm doing the dishes, while I'm mowing the lawn. Like informal, it's called informal meditation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so fantastic. That's one fantastic. of the, the best practices I implemented, and I actually got that from uh, I think it was Alan Watts or Jack mm-hmm. Cornfield, one of those guys. But Cornfield's was, big on it too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he talks about eating meditation and these mm-hmm. different practices, and it's oh, it's fantastic. But it's it lets you implement it during your day as a check in without saying, okay, I need to go sit on a pillow and burn. Yeah, some I don't incense. have to set aside this yeah. forty five minute block for it. And well, I'll that's still, great. That's great too. And I'll still set aside the block. But yeah. the the beauty is, it's kind of like. When you think of movement as a whole, instead of just your one hour exercise, right? Like I'm going to go for a three mile walk and just think, or I'll listen to audible on that walk or half the walk. I'll listen to audible and podcasts and half the walk. I won't, I'll just be mindful. And then, uh, I'll spend 15, 20 minutes in the dark room in silence. Maybe I'll have binaural beats. Maybe I'll throw in the casino and let the fucking led lights flash over my eyelids and fucking go deep that way. Um, but just having all these different tools that exercise that Dr. Quiet, Mm -hmm. you know, that's been the biggest thing to implement because I can trickle this shit in throughout the day. And by the end of the day, the cumulative, you know, uh, talking about the, the, the Pavel Tatsulin, you know, greasing the groove, you grease the groove on meditation by trickling that shit in five minutes at a time. And you do five of them, that's your 25 minutes right there. Mm-hmm. And overall, you feel better. You can do that with fucking movement too. You don't have to crush, you know, four sets of 12 on bench press or five by five. If you're doing, you know, 20 perfect push ups every hour on the hour, you still put in the work by the end of the day. Yeah. You know, so figuring that out for me on the Dr. Quiet side and how to implement all different forms of meditation. I mean, working in with the Tai Chi and Chi, you know, the Qi Gong standing breathwork practices that Paul check has been big on. I mean, having him out here was a fucking game changer for me because it really allowed me to implement the practices that I've read and tried to embody, but ha- you know, spending only really only the fucking three, three nights with him. Yeah. You know, like that 48 hour block just cemented in those practices for me to where now, like when I'm doing, a form of, of, and he, he dumbs it down too. He, he talks quite a bit about how ridiculous the mastery of movement can be in Tai Chi. Yeah, you know, yeah. when you have a master and take a guy <laughs> fucking 20 years to figure out to actually get in that zone where he's actually meditating while he's doing it because he's constantly thinking of these perfect movements. He's like, yeah. fuck all that. Yeah. You know, inhale as your arms go away from you. Exhale as your arms come back into the position. You don't take position. it that seriously. Yeah. It's just, I mean, it's, you're, you're, it's, it's play. And yeah, it's, it's play. It's yeah. play. And, but as I've, as I've began to practice that more, it's palpable. I feel the fucking shift in consciousness. I feel my emotions change. And I think those have been some of the biggest practices that I've had trickled in on a daily basis, you know, and, and, you know, Aubrey's getting ready with his book own the day, everything, even when we talk about this annual cycle, it all can be crunched down to a 24 hour cycle, Yep. you know, and that's something that I've been thinking about too, is when the sun sets and we get ready to be cold and winter time's coming in the evening what are the things that I, as I look back upon the day and I reflect hours before bedtime, preferably before dinner, what would I fucking remove from the day that didn't serve me? What would I change going forward? You know? And then when I go to lay down at night, I don't fucking lay in bed awake thinking of this could have been done better. That could have been done better. Cause I've already gone through the motions. I've already done the reps on the mental, emotional release and letting go of the shit that I didn't like. Yeah. And when I put in that work, then I'm fucking good when I lay down at night. I can rest. I can lay down and sleep and not worry about anything because I've already gone through everything that I didn't like and the things that I want to change. And I have a good viewpoint of what I'm going to do the next day. I've planted the seeds for tomorrow. It's huge. It's huge. And I, I, I resonate with that a ton. And that was, it was the difference for me that I was trying to do all the things. I was trying to do all the things. And I think when I actually just kind of piggybacks off of a, the, the most I don't want to say intense isn't the best word, but definitely the deepest mushroom trip that I've ever been on with you. And we, we, we had an amazing space and everybody got so much out of that was really understanding what the distractions were in my life. 
Like what was I, I was bringing these things into my life that were pulling me in different directions. And, and you said that was the me ceremony. That was the me ceremony. Yeah. yeah well, I, I, got to, I got to acknowledge my shadow and be f- completely embodied by my, what I would consider my shadow, which is kind of a woo woo term, but it was something I needed to realize and see in myself. And, um, because they all they, they rely the shadow and the light kind of and I love calling the light side the white shadow because they they rely on each other and not one's not better than the other and they both they both have a place but it was it was I would bring things up in this trip and it would and the word distraction would just as as soon as I would think of something distraction mm. cut it distraction cut it and it was that and I took that into the rest of my life and I was I would start having things come up and I felt so confident in my ability to just say I'm not available for that right now that's just not in alignment with where I'm going and at the end of the day I don't have the resources to be inefficient right now it would be cool I have been I've had that that was I've had that a lot of my life but now it's not that time and I take that into my training I take that into my day I'm, and it's it's incredible, you know. And one thing that I realized in that same experience, and on and as I kind of integrated back, was there's certain things in my life that I had put so much effort into that they didn't need that much energy anymore. Like for me personally, and where I'm at in my life, I don't have to think about food that much anymore. I really don't. Like you and I will talk about some things, and I'll implement some small things here and there about fasting, and but I really don't change. Like when I go to the grocery store, I don't have to think about buying healthy food. Yeah, I just do it. It's like it's autopilot, right? Oh, you've done the work. I've done the work, right? I've woke up for every day for the last decade with the pure intention of how do I help people. That's it. I don't honestly have to think about that anymore. That is who I am. Like I am on this planet to serve. And that's not something I have to really give a lot of conscious awareness to anymore because it's just there. So for me, it's like, well, where are the areas of my life that I need to give attention to? And what does that look like? And knowing that in five or 10 years, I won't have to think about those either. It'll be the next thing. Or they'll be different. They'll be different. They just change a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. But the investment of time and and I did putting the work in, it's like I earned that freedom and I earned that liberation. And I also... Again, circling back to self-awareness, I'm aware enough of myself to know when that's appropriate, what alignment actually feels like, what it feels like to play, when I need to play, when I need to be quiet, when I need to reflect on things, when I need to take a step back. Like those, just having some intuition around myself because we get so caught up in patterns and the world's not ever going to be free of distractions. Like you got to fucking take ownership of that. No one's going to do it for you. That's the discipline, right? Like Instagram is a motherfucker. Like that is (laughs) actually posted a song. I actually posted a song on my Instagram called, it called, it's called phone down. And it's a whole song about like, put your fucking phone down and just be here. (laughs) (laughs) That's really what it comes down to. It's like these things that we've, we've, we've as a species generated distractions for ourselves all over the place and they're not going to go away. We're going to keep doing it because it does in the short term make us feel good. But if you, if you have the mindset that happiness isn't really the goal, it's really the byproduct. Like that's just a feeling. It's an emotion. It's something, but you want to be able to fill it fully, just like you want to be able to feel sadness fully and just feel like what, what makes you feel life in a more full and complete way. And if you can ask yourself those questions and investigate that about yourself, fuck again, the word liberation just comes to mind. It's beautiful. But it takes again, like you're you're a master of self exploration, especially physically. Like it's it's super impressive, and I, and it's 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 so fun to be able to like again selfishly have these conversations where we get to just kind of brain dump on each other about all this kind of stuff. Yeah, like I think the big thing you touched on was like this idea of of feeling everything, but to truly feel that, you have to be present with it, right? And the distraction prevents us from feeling it. Because then we're unaware of where that feeling, even if we notice the feeling, positive or negative is there, we're not necessarily conscious of why it's there. We just feel it, right? And and Chuck, again, talked about this thing, name it, blame it, and tame it. (laughs) And so you say, you name it. Like, I feel like shit because, and you blame it. I feel like shit because this happened or so-and-so said this to me or blah, blah, blah. And then you tame it. You you categorize it. The things that you can change. Well, I can do this differently, and this is what I'll do. Planning, you know, going forward. And this shit's out of my fucking hands. There's nothing I can change about that. So, ah, deep fucking breath and let that <laughs> shit go because it's out of your fucking control, right? Yeah. But to name it, blame it, tame it allows you to p- put a spotlight on it and bring awareness to the situation, and then realize what's in your control and what's not in your control, and make decisions from there. Right. But you only get to that point if you fucking shine the light on it. Yeah. 
right? If you're fucking busy looking at all these gorgeous ladies on Instagram or, or having the fucking, you know, the, the, <laughs> the nine episode binge watch of, <laughs> of whatever thing just came out on Netflix, yeah. then you're, you're distracted. You're not in the moment. You're not aware of the feeling, right? Yeah. You're not aware of what's going on because you're, you're outwardly focusing your attention. Well, you're, you're in perpetual victimhood. You're even at the victim. You're the victim of hedonic you know, the hedonic circle jerk. Is yeah, what it could be it. pleasure. It could be, you could be always looking for fucking happiness, but in that searching, even in fucking Buddhism, they talk about that. The searching, yeah. the longing, that's the fucking pain. Yeah. That's the suffering. It's, it's the, in being when you experience it, right? When you experience all the good and all the bad, but only in being, do you alleviate the bad? Only in sitting with the pain, do you fucking realize where it's at and fucking shine the light on it and release it. That's Otherwise, a, that shit stays. <laughs> JP Sears is like he he articulates this in such a it's such a simple and, and beautiful way. It's just just feel the feelings, man. Just feel the feelings. And something I do in the in the personal development work that um, that I work on and what we're going to do with Aubrey and and go for your win round two is you got to track them down. I like, track the feelings down, you know, and create a relationship with them. Like where do they? Where's the root? Go find the. Don't look at the branches. Find the roots of that issue. Like they, whether that be happiness, sadness, whatever it is. If it's a pattern, if it keeps coming up in your life, you got to track it down to the root root and understand it look at it through a lens of compassion look at because the more compassion you can have for yourself the more you can put outward and that but it takes that investigation man and that comes from dr quiet Mm -hmm. (laughs) you got to put it in you got to put in the time and there's like i said you know many paths lead up the mountain that and i like all the fucking paths yeah i'm trying to find every trail up the mountain that way i have that many more tools in the bank it's something i talked about when i did the solo cast talking about my own uh, dealings with depression about, well, starting when I was a young man at seven, but really coming to a a, a, <laughs> a fucking tipping point about 12 years ago when I got out of college, just not having any tools was for sure one of the biggest reasons. And then the chasing, like, well, I'm going to chase... I'm going to chase pleasure through feeling. I'm going to use alcohol and bad drugs, as I call them, the drugs the that leave you feeling drugs. like shit the yeah. next day versus good drugs, the drugs that make you feel good and peaceful and, and happy the next day. Um, how do we fucking add these tools? You know, that's, that's really what it is. It's not just searching. It's, I think, short term to be present and to feel what you're actually feeling inside is incredibly important because all we have is the now, right? As, as Eckhart Tolle says, we only have the now. It's the only fucking time we have. So to be aware of our feelings right now. But long term, when I think about how am I going to deal with shit when it comes up in the future because it's guaranteed to come up, <laughs> how many tools can I add that will be fucking just right in line with a better quality of life, right in line with ways that I can manage stress better, ways that I can accept the challenges that I have and face them fucking head first. You know, like, like, uh, Barangi says, you know, with the Buffalo, Buffalo don't fucking run from the storm when it comes. Cause they know they can't outrun it. <laughs> they get shoulder to shoulder and they go fucking head first into the storm. That's right. Right. That's how you tackle fear. And that makes that, that short, burst of the storm go they go through the storm way faster by going head first right you get through that pain much quicker by tackling your fear head on Mm -hmm. and you do that shoulder to shoulder with your tribe you know you don't have to go alone but that's how you get through it you fucking source that out you see which direction it's blowing and you fucking go head on yeah and you got to know yourself well enough to know that know what you know what you're going to attract into your life because when you're when you have a relationship with yourself and you know what you're bringing, and you know what tools you have, and you can you start to seek out the people that can teach you, and that can be a, that you can be aligned together, mm-hmm. which is such a powerful thing. To, I mean, we're all just living this life, man. We're all just living this life and doing the thing, and and we do attend to just like vibe into each other, you know. And that's when you're open to that, and you have that presence, like shit. I think I can't say this year has been a complete shift in the way I look at that and look at the people that I surround myself with. Fuck yeah. Well, there's no mistakes and no coincidences. And, uh, just, you know, for me, we moved out of my mom's garage in April to Vegas Yeah, and we moved, uh, I went to fucking, I had a calling to come to paleo effects, not to learn anything new. Cause I'd already read all the books, but just to fucking meet people. And you were one of the first dudes that mind pump introduced me to. <laughs> we fucking got down on some DMT not long after. <laughs> like an hour later. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, a tight bond was formed. But um, 
Yeah, you know, and then you introduced me to Aubrey, and and uh, we Aubrey and I shared the same flight home with John Wolf, the fucking master strength coach here. And uh, fuck, dude, three months later, I got a job in here, and I'm living in Austin. Yeah, a lot has fucking changed. That, and was that crazy. took like a huge leap of faith and wanting to, you know, we had family in Vegas. My wife's from there. It was easy to say, all right, we'll cut our cost of living to a third of the Bay Area. And we'll, we'll still have family and we'll be just a short flight or a drive home. Much, much different moving to a town where you don't really know everyone there. And um, just a fucking lot of big question marks. But having that faith and that trust that everything's going to work out. And, and that was my uh, first five gram ground psilocybin <laughs> ceremony when I, I did that in Vegas. And... That gave me all the fucking trust. Like I saw being in Austin. Yeah. I saw the future. People talk about kind of having visions of the future. And I'd never truly experienced that before until that first five gram ground day. And um, it was just, there was just this lasting peace. It was one of the fucking easiest heroic doses I've ever done in the, in yeah. the sense that it was like, oh, this is the way. This is the path. Do it. And everything will fall into place. And that's kind of how it's gone. Just having that trust and putting one foot in front of the other. I kind of think of this um, like an Indiana Jones when he can't see the fucking bridge and he's got to fucking yeah. take each step. You know, <laughs> as he takes each step, the fucking brick shows up underneath his foot, right? One of the best scenes. Yeah, in man. Movie ever. Sometimes you got to fucking do that in life. Yeah. There's too many questions and you can't outthink all the variables. Yeah. You can't think of everything that'll possibly happen. And half the time, more than fucking half the time, you spend all this time thinking of every variable and it ends up being something you didn't even think of. Yeah. So it's better to just fucking try it. And if you make a mistake, that's fine. You learn from it. The only true mistake is the one you don't learn from because then you'll repeat that. So it's yeah. still not a mistake. It's going to keep coming. It's going to keep coming until you shine light on it. Like you said, I said so often, if it keeps coming up and this is where that statement, like don't get hung up on the past comes from really. And it's, I think that's, I, in my view, a lot of times and not all the time, but a lot of times that's like, that's you're, you're missing something there that you're kind of spiritually bypassing, not seeing your own shit. Cause if something keeps coming up from your past and you see the same pattern in your life, you've got to acknowledge it. You got, that's where I talk about taking a step back and going back to the empty barbell. It's like, okay, let me go, let me investigate this and mm. see where this is at. And we'll see where this is coming from. Cause then those leaps of faith become so much easier because you have more trust in yourself and trust in, in your intuition and you don't have, you're, you're not, you're, you're getting rid of that sense of control of things that you can't control yeah. and controlling what you can and putting your energy there and you're we're, not spread so thin. We're in control of fucking far less than we think we are. <laughs> far less. <laughs> you know, just focus on the shit you can't control and the rest that you can't, that's fine because yeah. that's the majority of it. You know, control the controllable factors, do what's right for you and learn all the tools you can to help, right? Because there's a shit ton of them, you know? But if you don't have them, you don't know. And that's what's so cool about podcasts, really. I mean, think about how much information we get to share on these. Not that this is like, I don't know, this is a pretty fucking good podcast. Listen to all the goddamn knowledge bombs this we're is, dropping This today. is great. You're, you're <laughs> <laughs> but really, though, it's like I actually, after we uh, had that pod, one of my favorite podcasts of all time with Mike Salemi, we, we were just buzzing afterwards, man, because this guy came on and he had, I gave him an opportunity to talk about things he had never talked about. Like, this guy is a, a absolute gangster when it comes to strength and conditioning, so intelligent, but had never talked about his spiritual path and got to share that. And afterwards, we were talking about how amazing it is that we get to share. I get to share a human connection with whoever wants to listen to it because they have a phone. Like that's magic. It's magic that we get to share this information. And guys like Chris Ryan, like that guy, I've never met him. And he's still one of my heroes. I can have a hero I've never met. And even his, his book was great. But mm -hmm. at a certain point with him, it wasn't about... And following him and even Joe Rogan and these guys, like it wasn't about the information anymore. It was about their, their, their way of thinking about things. Like how did they get to that information? What was the conclusion? Like what was their thought process? And you have a place to see that and share that. And it's like, oh, I can adapt that into my life. And I, it's a shortcut for me. You know, then I can, I can learn from someone's experience who has much more than me. Yeah, man. I mean, Rogan got me into float tanks. Uh, I still haven't done the massive, but massive edible in a float tank. <laughs> which he's a huge fan of. That would freak I'm, I'm out. fucking scared. Of, I'm scared of a massive <laughs> cannabis dose more than I'm scared of fucking ten grams of mushrooms. I'm scared. The, uh, the massive cannabis dose is probably one of the most scary. Yeah, like things you could put in my put in front of me. But he illustrates the tools, you know, yeah. and he gives you he gives you ideas 
and different things. And even in, even in his, you know, when he talks about his realization uh, on a massive edible in Hawaii with his family and seeing the dolphins come up and play and just keep coming up out of the water and fucking with the humans and playing with them and showing off. And he's like, man, what if I was a dolphin? And like, I wouldn't I do the exact same shit that dolphins doing. And then the, the realization right there that maybe this consciousness that we all are, like I would be that dolphin if I was in that. And then maybe I would be Connor living <laughs> Connor's life. If I was fucking born with your circumstances and, and being raised by your grandparents and fucking your life, maybe yeah. I would be fucking you doing that. And that's the most compassionate, empathetic viewpoint ever is to embody that right but hearing it from different voices and that's something that i love you know dorian yates is one of my favorite all-time guests on the rogan show not because i agreed with everything he was saying which i did it felt like he took the words right out of my (laughs) my, right out of my mouth when he was talking about the difference between dmt and ayahuasca but so much of what he was saying was just it's powerful and it's powerful and beautiful to hear it come from a different person Mm -hmm. you know and especially all different walks of life like you look at a guy who's arguably the greatest bodybuilder of all time, so focused on being yoked and just a fucking giant beast. And you hear like his son, like maybe you don't come into school today with me to pick me up or because it's like all the kids freak out when like your dad's a fucking gorilla, you know, <laughs> he fucking steps <laughs> in the classroom, <laughs> shit like that. And he doesn't even think of himself that way because over the, it's taken him years to build his body that way, you know, but different things like that help, help me, to kind of figure out people and to see like, oh, maybe that's what it would be like to be that yoked, you know? Yeah. Maybe that's what it'd be like. Or maybe that's what it'd be like to be small, you know? Like, I don't think of myself as a big person and certainly being around big people, um, there's much bigger, you know? Yeah. Like, I fought at light heavyweight, uh, trained with heavyweights. There's much bigger even in fighting. But still, like, there's times, like, uh, in an ayahuasca ceremony where fucking this girl just dropped to her knees and she was like, <gasps> The Hulk. Oh my God. Then obviously her, her visionary field had been <laughs> changed somewhat <laughs> due to the yeah. the plants, but um, you know what I'm saying? And then it's, oh yeah, yeah, I am uh, a big, bigger person, you know? And then my wife, like thinking about her, like she's half my size. She weighs 110, 115 pounds, you know, like what, what's that like? She can fucking sit in full Lotus in the passenger seat of my Prius. You know, I can't even fucking come close to that shit. You can barely you know, like, fit in all this Prius. room you got. When we're, don't complain about sitting in the middle seat on the airplane. You got hella room. Well, if you want to take that a little, a little deeper, it's like we do get it desensitized to who we, who we are and what we bring. Like I'm a big guy too. And I don't mm-hmm. think about myself as big because just like you, I surrounded myself with bigger people. Like uh, more often in my life and things in endeavors that I was in, I wasn't big enough. Yeah. You know, I was like, I wasn't big enough to play division one tight end. And that like crushed me at one point in life, you know, and I was like good enough, but I wasn't big. It was like, it wasn't me. And then same thing. It's like going in, in the, in the business world in the podcast world, like, am I big enough? I'm not big enough. When people mm. looking from a different perspective are like, dude, you're killing it, dude, that you're huge. You know, like, Oh, you're a big guy. And it's like, you don't even think about it. You're like, Oh, I need to, I need to take a step outside of myself and see who I really am. And that's one thing that Paul Selig's work in the, the book of mastery that we're both diving into now is, is really opened my eyes to. You know, I was like, understand like who I am. I, I, I know who I am. I really do. Like my soul knows who I am. I thought you were going to say the whole thing. I wasn't going to say I the whole thing. I know who I am. I know. Oh no. I know who I am. I know what I am. I know, I know how I serve. serve. I yeah, am here. Bro. I am here. I am here. Hell yeah. Stuff's great, but it's, it's, you're like, you're deep down, you know who you are. And when it gets covered up by distraction, by expectation, by fear. And really when it comes down to it, like that's, that's our purpose is to find out, like figure out who we are deep down and express that fully, you know? And the way I think about it when we're going through this is I love the visionary like aspect of thinking about life flowing through you. Like you're not living life. Life is flowing through you and it will, it will trickle away at some point. Like this life will trickle away and it'll move on to something else. But through life, we end up putting these boundaries and restrictions on the amount of life that flows through us, like through our experience, would that be fear, judgment, shame, expectation? Like they start to constrict life and it takes expectation is a fucking big one. (laughs) Well, expectation comes out of fear, right? Out of, out of the need for control or desire. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. that's true. It it can be just desire. It doesn't necessarily need to be, it can be both, you know, but either way, desire is not, I was reading this thing today in the gene keys. 
There's nothing inherently wrong with desire. It's the feeling that accompanies it. Mm. We're here to desire. We're here to want. We're here to fucking roam, to experience. That's why we fucking explore. <laughs> yeah. You know, like there's not much left to explore. Humans already did it, but we fucking explore for a reason. And we're trying to leave Earth to explore more. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like it's in us. Curious motherfuckers. Yeah, we want to experience more, right? And more is fucking desire, but it's the attachment of the emotion to that that makes it wrong or right. Yeah, that leads to suffering or not. Well, that's and that's what Alan Watts talks about too. Is like you're a nerve ending on the universe here to experience the universe. Like that's it. Just like you have nerve endings on your finger to feel like that's so to not allow yourself to feel the feelings that we were talking about earlier, like you're, you're limiting your experience. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, that's one of my favorite statements is, you know, the ocean waves, the tree leaves and the universe peoples. (laughs) 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 And here we are. Right. So when things do get you bogged down and you feel small and you feel broken, like, does you just need to understand like that's, that's where you are. That's what you are. And you can't have the flip side of that without the feeling of small, the feeling of fucking, (laughs) I'm in the wrong spot. Yeah. This isn't what I want. You know? Yeah. You don't get the, this is fucking perfect. This is awesome. This is right where I want to be without having first experienced and re-experiencing that whole fucking line of polarity. (laughs) It's all there for a reason. Well, the the unpacking too, man. I like to go back to what you're talking about being a kid, raising a kid. Like my first ayahuasca experience, I got to feel that about my mom. I got to experience my mom and my dad at the age that they had me. Mm. And it was like, oh man, they didn't, they didn't know what the fuck they were doing. And I sit here and I, I, I give them a hard time for that. Like they were in so far over their head, just like I would be if I was them. And just think if I was them in their position and their experience, I would be them. And, you know, Sam Harris talks about this a lot with his book, Free Will, which is a fantastic book. But really, I think you can, I don't know how much I can, I I kind of do. I don't believe in true free will. I really don't. I think that we are built up of experience and we're it's it, it influx at the present moment to expression, right? Like this podcast is a form of expression. The way I move is a form of expression. The way I speak, the way I carry myself, how I engage with people, but it's based upon my experience. I can own, I don't know what I don't know. So all my decisions, the decision-making process is based on context. And if I limit my experience in life, then I limit my context that limit my free will. So to expand upon my experience and release the boundaries of experience, like I was saying earlier, and if identify fear and I identify the limiters and broaden that, then I give myself more context. I remove the shame, let myself experience, and then I can really make choices and really express myself in an authentic way, business wise, personally, in relationships and friendships, in the way I talk to a fucking cashier at the grocery store store. Like all those things matter and they all add up. And it's just one little thing. Like somebody said something in the pleasure monkey group the other day and said, uh, nobody has nothing to teach you. I was like, that's the best double negative ever. <laughs> Cause it, it's all context, right? Yeah. It's like, even I used to, when I was, you know, I go on dates and stuff and it's like, I'll go on a date. That's terrible. Like it, where I said, we just don't get along at all. And I, and I leave it going, wow, I just learned a lot about people that are way different than me. <laughs> yeah. That was great. <laughs> That yeah, rather than that was a complete waste of my time. I'll never get those three hours back. <laughs> yeah, it's like, God, you I know? spent $30 on drinks for that. It's like, no, I just got a tremendous amount of context, which then can lead into stronger empathy. You know, I can look at somebody and be like, man, if I was, if I was in their shoes and had lived their life, I'd be where they are. And we're all, I don't see us as much as like all living, like a bunch of other people living my life or, or, or anything like that. I think we're just all one big thing. We're all a collective. We're all connected in this one big massive web covered in dew drops and are just reflections of each other. And things that you notice, just like Paul Selig says in his book, things that you notice are things that serve you in some time. And you can walk into a room as one version of yourself and notice a bunch of things, walk into that same room 10 years later and notice a whole bunch of different things because they serve you in a different way based upon the lens that you view the world through. Yeah, and you reread a book. Same fucking thing, man. I've, I, it's one of the reasons I reread how to eat, move, and be healthy by Paul check. And I reread, uh, a new earth by Eckhart Tolle at least once a year. Cause you fucking walk through that book with new, with new lens on, <laughs> with new filters, you receive more, you see things differently, different things stand out to you that are more meaningful than they were the first time. Or you notice things differently and different things resonate with you because you, that's what you need at that moment. Yeah. You know, it's the same thing with the psychedelic experience. You could do ayahuasca, <laughs> annually every year till the day you die and there won't be a single fucking ceremony there might be some similarities 
but it's never going to be the same one. It's always going to be different. There's always going to be new information. Well, even when you revisit the same same places, as I would say, in, in psychedelic experiences, like you go into those with a different context based upon your learnings from last time, and you expand mm-hmm. upon those. Yeah. But you've you've done you've you've passed the test in a way, or you've gained that experience that was needed. You know, one thing that you're big about that I think is fantastic when it comes to psychedelic experiences is implementing the lessons before you go back in. Don't go back yeah. in premature and don't lean on it too heavy. It's let me take what I learned, apply that, integrate, spend some time, work with it embed those into my life and then take that version of myself into the next one. Yeah, that's a big one that, that, that came from learning the hard way. You know, I <laughs> wanted to get new, like, yeah, I got all this new intention, new, new questions. And then I get the same fucking answers from two, three ceremonies again. Cause it's like, Hey, you didn't do this. Hey, you still haven't done this thing I wanted you to do. You still haven't started meditating. That was a fucking big one. Yeah. That's why that one came up to me three ceremonies in a row. Been telling you to meditate. You haven't meditated yet. <laughs> telling you to do more yoga. You're not doing any yoga. Yeah. You know, like, fuck, man. It's just, it's, it's, there's an intelligence in these plants. And I think it's important that you don't take it for granted, you know, as it, it can be either an extremely life changing, powerful experience that you look back upon with gratitude and know what it's done for you. Or it's just that really cool time you were there and you fucking saw some wacky stuff and wow, that was, that was different. Yeah. You know, it's one or the other. When it's, it brought, it broadened your perspective so much when you experience something aside from normal everyday waking consciousness. Talk about that. You know, there's, there's things that I like, and I wanted to ask you about this. There's things that I want to I want to bridge the gap for people because oftentimes when I speak about ayahuasca, everyone's like, "Man, where's your favorite place to go in the Amazon?" And uh, do you know any local spots? And obviously, we can't talk about local spots, and not that I know of any. Um, but uh, you know, what's what's empower? How do you bridge the gap? It's like what's what's an empowering way you can go deep? So this, you know, I've I've only experienced a couple times now grinding psilocybin. Uh, and taking five grams with squeezed lemon, the way Dan Hardy taught me, the way the Mayans used to do it. And I would put that on par with ayahuasca. 100%. You know, my, minus the purging. Um, obviously, you, you would need a guide, but not necessarily a shaman. And so that takes some of the legwork out of getting there. They're accessible because they're fucking all over the place. Um, and then you could just travel to Costa Rica where it's legal. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, you know, to have that accessibility, it, it definitely opens the door to people being able to go deep. What, what were some of the major take homes in the me ceremony you had where you really got to focus on yourself? I mean, I would, I got to acknowledge, and I would agree before we could jump into that, that it's on par with ayahuasca. That was the first thing I said afterwards. Um, it was different because they're a little bit more mobile. And one mm-hmm. thing that's I really enjoy about the psilocybin experience is that it kind of, you can, you have a little bit more negotiation with it than you do with ayahuasca. With ayahuasca, you're, like, you're going to be laying down. You're floored. You don't need to be grounded. Moving, you don't need to be moving around. You probably could, but it's definitely not the move, right? Where for us in our situation in, uh, in Costa Rica, where it was legal, um, we could walk around, we go outside mm-hmm. for a second. And then sometimes if you, if I, and I enjoy doing this is doing something where it's pretty heavy, but you also create a container to have conversation in the, in the space. So it is very flexible, but, in the way we did it, where we were just kind of with ourselves. I mean, the first fun thing I got to do, and this is where I, when I first dropped in, was got to go to like the, the origin place of dark feminine desire and got to, again, create empathy for something I didn't understand because it's not within me. I got to explore something outside of that, which was kind of a fun... Unpack a, that for me. Dark feminine desire. I, that's all. I can't... It's almost hard to, to even explain. It was just... It was something I was always curious about and didn't really get. And it was... Because um, I, I really am fascinated by uh, evolutionary psychology and, and how, what makes us tick, especially when I have that kind of perspective on free will that is, I believe it's kind of limited. So mm-hmm. I think we have these drivers, these, these primal drivers, and I got to go into something that I didn't have. I, I can understand the, the masculine desire piece is there for me. I get that how sexually we, we, we strive for things that are essentially masculine expression. And I think that's, that's a, that's a healthy understanding if you, if you can have the self-awareness to, to create that, but I'd never seen it from the feminine side. So I really got to see that. And I, and I always, in a lot of my trips, I'll have guides, like really they almost like look like people or some kind of entity. And I remember going into that place and looking at her, the kind of the, the guide in this place. And I was like, why is it so easy to smile at you? <laughs> Cause I just couldn't quit giggling. She was like saying these like kind of harsh, aggressive things. She's like, I'm just saying it how you need to hear it. 
And I was like, it's perfect. <laughs> and that was, remember, you started I, flirting with her. I was, oh, for sure. I loved her. She was great. I was like, I'm so glad you exist. Even though you, you kick me in the ass sometimes. Like it was, it was great. But from there, it really went into, um, I said like I was fully embodied by my shadow, which I consider, I felt like it, uh, it was strange. And if you've seen true blood or any like vampire show, mm-hmm. where you like convert into a vampire. It was like very powerful. It felt very good. I called it like astral cocaine. Like it was very deep, powerful, dark, but it was like I needed it. It was like medicine for me at the time. Like you need, you have been pretending like you don't get angry because you have an ex, but you think that people have an expectation of you to be a big fucking goofy teddy bear all the time. And it was like, you don't need help being a big kid. Like you, that you're a fucking man child. That's you. Right. Roy yeah. Munson, a man child. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, you don't need help with that. That's, but you do need to fucking dial it in. You need, there's times you need to be relentless in your life. You got to know what you want. You got to fucking get it. And it was, it was tough talking away. And it was, and I was like, yes, that's right. You're right. I needed, I needed to hear that. I needed to see that. I needed, and one thing is like, I can intellectually understand that, but I hadn't felt it. And I felt that. And then I started kind of unpacking some things, um, that, uh, we talked about earlier where I was kind of seeing distractions in my life. What, what were the distractions? Where were they coming from? I was bringing them into my life, taking ownership of that. Why did I create that? What lesson was there? Um, went through, you know, a previous relationship and, and I had this really visionary state where, you know, she was saying like, you don't get it. And I was saying, you don't get it. <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> oh yeah, we don't, we just don't get it. It's just, it, it's there, but it's, you know, it was, it was very strange and that was, that was oddly liberating in a way. So, uh, there was some big takeaways there, but it really came down to that. The shadow piece really was what stuck with me and, and understanding why that exists, where that comes from and how I can implement it in my life healthy. Because if you, if you start to create a relationship with your shadow, in my belief, you can ride that shit like a fucking dragon. You can take, it's a, it's a great servant, terrible master. It's almost like being in touch with the wild man. You know, reading uh, Iron John. Kyle, Kyle reads men. a lot of books, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, that's not a book that I recommend to everyone, but for men out there that are feeling um, uh, like, what do you do in the modern world? What do you do with, with the, the lack of fucking, there's less male energy and the male energy that's there is shifted. And you see the, the gross outcome of ego through the president and you see this you know this these other forms of maleness that are less desirable or more desirable and what's okay and what's not okay and ultimately i think iron john is is it's written in poetry but the author does a great job of breaking down like all right we're going to press pause on the story here and dive into that and he fucking sections out pieces where he really breaks down like what it means to be a man yeah and what it's important for us to tap into our wild side to our fucking wild hairy fucking manness yeah you know and i think that's part of uh coming to grips with the shadow is just understanding that there's there's some desires there's some things that may be frowned upon by society that I need to embody at times that I need yeah. to be a part of that. I need to let loose. It's okay to fucking be angry. It's okay to feel fucking rage. And then to know which outlet, which Avenue is it okay to express that in? Yeah. Right. Well, you, so that you're, I don't then you're just, creating, then you're creating the environment for that expression and it's healthy that way. Mm-hmm. But what we're seeing a lot in, in the, in the climate nowadays, everybody's getting fired <laughs> from every kind of political and, and uh, public standing. It's like that. I feel like that's unhealthy power driven masculine expression in a lot of ways. Because, well, yeah. And they, they were they, obviously Rogan did a great episode with Duncan Trussell and uh, Chris Ryan. Yeah, that was fantastic. And they were talking quite a bit about that, but like how the work environment, the office, becomes you know the the tribal community the village you know and then this, these sexual desires are still there and then ultimately you have pull it down ob come on Aubrey's rip it out Aubrey's 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 pants off. Fred is we're uh, about to yeah, talk about, about masculine yeah. desire <laughs> just as we're talking about uh sexual problems in the workplace and we're on the, on about to office right pull, his, pull his dick out for us to see he's about to whip it out on the, on the pool table <laughs> He didn't, though, because no, he's that was intelligent different. and he knows he doesn't want to be yeah. the next Matt It was Lauer. just a joke, guys. But yeah, I think I think that's those are natural things that are being implemented in a way that, that, number one, we're no longer in a world where that's appropriate. Number two, they can be done in a right way and a wrong way, as with anything in life. 
you know, and making someone feel small, making someone feel like they have to do the thing you want them to do. That's never the fucking way to get it done. No. And it's never the right thing to do. But, uh, and this isn't, you know, as they say on the, on the show with Rogan and Duncan and and Chris, um, it's, (laughs) there are things that aren't okay from the, the liberal side. There are things that aren't okay from the conservative side. There's, there's ways to do right things and wrong things, but beautifully to fucking pull an end to this piece here on my point is that there is there are some fucking things we can gather on what are the right way to execute and be a fucking real man and those those things have been lost in our society they've been lost through the 50s the 60s the 70s the 80s and the 90s right and so tapping back into that is extremely liberating and it feels right because, you know, talking about evolutionary biology and things like that, like we're fucking geared to act and behave and do certain things. Yeah. You know, that, that I'm not saying we're, we're geared to rape or we're geared to fucking misappropriate and treat people incorrectly. Yeah, we're I'm not saying, made to be in an office, first of all. Yeah, we're not made to be in an office, right? <laughs> we, are, we are made to, to do some fucking hard physical activity. We are made to interact with other people. We're made to challenge ourselves and to fucking compete you know, but to cooperate more often than we compete, just like fucking Darwin said, cooperation is in fucking his book a hell of a lot more than competition is. Yeah. Right. But competition is the one we gravitate. To. Oh, that's right. You know, competition. Let's focus on that word. Yeah. Not cooperation. Cooperation is how we fucking get here. It but is. it's still right to compete. It's still right to fucking exercise that shadow if we yeah. have it. Right. If we if we're aware of it. Exactly, dude. And it's funny, like talking about masculine expression and, and, and being a like being a man and doing some like I had this such a great time with you guys the other day because I sh- I killed a deer like last week, and I got to bring meat that I had shot, gutted, quartered, and cut out of an animal to a dinner with my like my family, and share that, and it was really fantastic. And I felt so I had done that in so long. You know, I grew up in a world where I worked manual labor since I was like twelve. Like I got I got to put my hands on things and finish projects and do work and see the gratification of that. And then, and now it's a little bit different. A lot of things are virtual and you don't get that same satisfaction, but there's parts of me. That's why I love the gym so much. I could go in there and put in some fucking work. Mm -hmm. And dude, I had this time out. We were both in Encinitas, California a few months back, hanging out with some guys. And it was me and you and Aaron Alexander were sitting around going like, there's a lot of feminine dudes around here. (laughs) I I was like, this motherfucker needs to pick up a sandbag and just pick it up. Take it over there, set it down. That's it. Do that a bunch of times. Run like, some hill sprints. Just, just, just do, do something. Some, just, just grunt crush a little something. bit. Like, you want to yeah. punch me in the chest, dude? I'll be fine. You need yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> it's medicine for you. But at the same time, it's like we, we have to find that. We got to dig into ourselves and find that as, as a culture. Because if you want to listen about, listen to the way that power structures have changed in the, in, in the environment that we're in now, Simon Sinek's book, Leaders Eat Last, fucking changed my entire perspective because at a point Wait, did you read that book this year i read that uh i read that two years ago okay first well i got a, I, I, well, i'll let you finish this uh on that but i want to ask you what your what were the favorite books you read in 2017 oh, okay since this is that. the 2017 okay. review podcast but i, I want to jump into this just because it is relevant from where we're at is that at one point it's called leaders eat last because there was a point where you were if you were a leader in the tribe right so you and i being large able-bodied men would be hunters and warriors, right? So you would hunt, you would provide, you would get the best women, the best cuts of meat, the best everything, you get preferential treatment essentially. But when shit went down and there was a war, you were the most likely one to die. You were willing to put it all out there. It was like you got the most and you gave the most. That's why you got the best women because they needed your kids because you were probably weren't going to live that long because you're going to go fucking fight the Sioux Indians, right? Like that's just how it went down. And that was, that was the mindset. It was like, I will give everything because, and, and the recipro- reciprocity of that from the tribe was that you got a lot. What we have now is, is people, and you see this in the, when the example he brings up is the financial crisis, right? You have these CEOs, these companies that are leaders that are taking and taking and taking. And then when it comes time to buck up and take ownership of the shit that you fucking put yourself in, they skate right out. 
and there's no accountability anymore. And account the lack no of accountability. They fucking bonus themselves with their tax dollars. Exactly, and that's the example. <laughs> that's the example of quote unquote success in our culture now. Mm. And it's got everything all fucking backwards, and the power dynamics are weird. Where people don't have to. And now you're seeing a massive outcry in in the sexual piece and the sexual harassment piece because people are just fucking sick of it, man. People are sick, of, and that's where this like whole idea of white privilege and all that stuff comes from. Because it's like people are just sick of the people in power never having to own their shit and I, I have to agree with them in a yeah. way I don't think it's the handled the best way in, in a lot of the times but at the same time it's like fuck man people got to do something dude you know they got to do something and it is it is crazy yeah that's my so leaders eat last Simon Sinek one of the, my favorite books of all time also another guy that I just absolutely love what he has to say especially when it comes to millennials that is since I'm the I'm the kid of the group <laughs> <laughs> you're the oldest millennial I know so Let's see here. What let's let's look on 2017. What were your favorite books of 2017? My favorite by far is Gene Keys by Richard Rudd. And uh, I'll qualify it this way. Well, first, <laughs> a, a part of me. This is funny because I'm going to tell you what's going through my head right now. It's funny because it may ultimately make people not want to read the book, <laughs> but that's okay because you'll be drawn to it if you're drawn to it. Just like a new earth, if you fucking. In the first, in the introduction to a new earth, he says, this book may not be for you, right? It may not be for you. Uh, five years ago, if someone introduced me to Gene Keys, I'd have fucking read the intro and been like, fuck off. <laughs> but um, through some of my experiences with ayahuasca, I am open to a lot of the concepts that are in it. And um, man, it's a fucking game changer. It really is. It's not a book you read straight through. Um, it it is amazing how much science he combines through he combines science but he also he also shifts that into the i ching through chinese wisdom and a number of other philosophies and ancient texts and wraps them all into one but i, I uh, i'm going to leave it at that cuz i don't want to turn people off from it if you get the book it's 20 bucks on amazon read the fucking introduction it is a game changer because in many ways it's given me pointers and you talked about the shadow. That's a word that's used. So he goes through your gene keys, and uh, out of the 64 gene keys, you have a set number that you're given, and you have a shadow for each one that may be considered the negative that you transcend to the gift. And in the gift, you see, and then uh, if you can live the gift, you're doing well, and then the city is the fucking highest point. That would be God, God consciousness, Christ consciousness, Buddha, whatever fucking language you want to use. But the embodiment of those things, and then the language used. You know, you interviewed uh, Matt from Procrabulary, and it's language. Mark. Mark, there we go. <laughs> it's language that helps you really decipher and figure shit out. And it's funny because some of the language that I've seen, like for a shadow, I'm like constriction. Like, how is that a fucking shadow for me? I don't, I don't know what constriction is. Then I read the passage on it, and I'm like, oh, fuck. That is spot on. <laughs> like, some of the hardest points in my life, I felt like I was suffocating. Like, yeah. there was no way out. Like, I just felt fucking so claustrophobic. And I'm not claustrophobic by the true sense of the word, but just in life, I just felt fucking suffocated with all the shit going down. There was no way out. And when you can recognize that shadow, and you know what the gift is beyond that, I know how to transcend then like, oh, I need to shift to this piece and this is the way that I do that. But what's beautiful about the book is that he'll say like, we are supposed to have, just as in psychedelic ceremonies, we're supposed to have the fucking shot. <laughs> we're so, it's, it's there on purpose yeah. for us to transcend so we know the beauty of the gift. If you're just fucking walking around, if we're all born like Jesus or Buddha, and we have no fucking transformation period, there's nothing to look back on and say like that was, you know, it's like Aubrey says, like if you fucking have all the gifts and no challenges, what's the point of the video game? It's like yeah. fucking punching in the game genie and having unlimited lives and unlimited bullets. And it's, it's a fucking shitty game. It's no fun to play. Yeah. Right. But it's the language that they use. And I, it's blown me away by how on point that book has been detailed for me and for my wife, and for everyone that I've fucking given that book to, because it's personalized. And that's, again, something that I would not have been open to based on time and location of birth. <laughs> that shit, it's not going to tell you avoid your boss in the month of March or any kind of nonsense horoscopes. Um, but 
you know, the way he illustrates it through the holographic universe and what I had seen in a vision in ayahuasca when asking about my next child was there is a time and a place when we are born on purpose by design. It's not by chance. It's not a fucking mistake. It's not random. There is nothing random. True. And understanding that has given me just enough open-mindedness to fucking read the book, and it's fucking blowing me away. Do you have to have your uh, 23andMe results to dive into that? Not at all. All you need to know is the exact time and location of when you, when and where you were born. You punch it in online for free. It print, You can print your gene keys, and then you just fucking dive in from there. But you don't even have to use the book that way. Because it's based off the I Ching and a no- number of other things, you can meditate on a question. And what's odd, odd, oddly enough... Before I read, when I read that in the intro, I was like, oh, okay. Well, before I dive into my gene keys, I'm going to ask, close my eyes, meditate for a second and ask, what should I learn first? And I flipped open to the 48th gene key, which happens to be one of my keys to love. And I was like, fuck, (laughs) no mistakes. Fucking open up right to that. And I dove in and there was so much on it because my shadow in that period is, or for that gene key is seriousness. And that's something I've been given. You talk about, you know, not learning from the medicine. I kept getting seriousness over and over again in different ceremonies until finally, as I think I mentioned on your podcast on the ayahuasca one, Mm -hmm. I had my first laughing purge in the ceremony. And I was like, why am I fucking laughing? And <laughs> that was, was the like, best. That was the best. It's not that serious. And I was like, oh, the ayahuasca <laughs> ceremony is not that serious. It was yeah. like, no dummy, life. It's not that serious. Dude, I had that, not to, not to interrupt you, but I had that laughing fit on my third night, first ceremony, third night of ayahuasca, where I was, uh, I was, I tapped into what I consider like the Christ consciousness. And I was just watching humanity. We were just laughing. I was just cackling. I could not quit laughing at just how silly we are as a humanity. And how we're, we're just like this point in it. We're like, we're like, oh, evolution happened. It's like, no, motherfucker, it's happening right now. We're just a point in the whole spectrum. And it was just, it was, it was incredible. But yeah, dude, I've got to dive into that book now that you, you sold me on it. Yeah. Well, it's funny too. When you talk evolution, it's like uh, you can believe in God and still believe in evolution. And if you believe in God and don't believe in evolution, God would have done a shitty fucking job if this is his finished product, right? <laughs> no like, shit. This dude. is a fucking joke for a finished product. If God is all perfect, yeah. there's another yet another contradiction, yeah. right? It, it can be a work in progress. Yeah. There can be more days to the timeline, however that fucking gets extrapolated in the seven days of creation or whatever it is, the 12 yeah. days of Christmas. I don't know. I'm I don't know. It's all the same. But you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's a fucking work in progress. You know what I'm saying? Like, come on. It's, yeah. we're still evolving. We're still have very much animal traits and instincts, even from, not even just from a, a, a evolutionary biology standpoint, but even from the inner workings of our brain, like fucking Dan Hardy talks about that all the time, why he continues to want to fight. Even after done many, many more ayahuasca ceremonies than I have, he wants to tap into his reptilian brain. Yeah. He wants that primordial fucking instinct of fight or flight. My life's on the line and yeah. he feels whole. He feels completely human and male when he fucking does that. Do you feel like, cause I get the urge to fight more often now than I think I have. And then this is after numerous psychedelic experiences, right? And I think more tapped in, but it's like, I get the urge. To, I, I want to fight sometimes. Like fight with something or some, someone. I get to fight with things and do Muay Thai. And well, shit like we're, that. Looking, we're looking it's for funny. things like that because it is inherently in us to battle. And we don't have that. And the battle's taken away. And, and I think it's important. And it's one of the reasons I still compete in jiu-jitsu. It's not that I think I'm going to be the best jujitsu guy i'm i'm fucking late in the game you know and and that's okay but every time i compete do i have to grapple with my emotions fuck yes every time does all the meditation and breath work and honing and getting into the zone does that get put to test it gets put to the greatest test because ultimately somebody's trying to rip my arm off or choke me unconscious right so where are the way what are the ways that we can test ourselves that are healthy you know, I'm not, I'm not receiving brain damage. I'm not getting hit in the head in jujitsu. It's pow- a powerful tool for me to put into practice the things that I'm constantly working on. And how that gets extrapolated in the real world is, well, if I can remain calm in the face of fucking real danger, I damn sure can remain calm when somebody cuts me off on the road yeah. or when I'm in an argument with my wife. 
you know, and that's still something I'm working on too. Again, working, working fucking <laughs> that's progress. A, that's right? a role. That's a role, dude. Yeah, and that's, that's part that's of the fucking challenge in that part way. of the fucking evolution for sure. But I think having those things it, it can be essential to how we operate and 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 again tapping into some of that primordial shit that we don't get to. We got to fucking release the wild man. We got to do some shit. We got to go hunting. Mm-hmm. We got to do things that are in our nature and inherent to us for our survival that make us feel alive. And, and you know, what I get in the jujitsu mats far exceeds what I get from lifting weights or running. And I love all those things. Yeah. I love all of it, right? But I need that one piece of competition, the human interaction. About to say the, the external variable, because that's the thing about a kettlebell or barbell or the road, whatever you're, whatever you're on, like that thing stays the same all the time. Like a 400-pound barbell is a 400-pound barbell every time. And I can change around it, but I don't have the, the variable of... of their whole intention spectrum, right it's yeah. like i, I want to like that that's a whole different that's a whole different component maybe i just need to get dive deeper into muay thai dude my yeah. extremely mediocre skills that need to be improved upon yeah, i think martial arts are incredibly important and not from a i mean for for many reasons but you know somebody was talking with me about about my son the other day it was Juan. Juan was like what, what are you gonna when are you gonna get your kid into sports and do all this and that you know, because Bear's getting older now. He's two and a half, and he's obviously Basically a grown shows, ass man. He shows an interest for a lot of things, but I only have two rules, and they're when it comes to activities, and they're there for for multiple reasons. But one is he has to do music till he's eighteen. Now the flexibility is he can choose any form of fucking music he wants but he's got to play it for the year. So if he chooses, I want to learn piano, he's got to do piano for the year. If he says, I fucking hate piano a month into it, you're signed up for another 11 months. Then you can switch to violin or fucking guitar or anything else. Yeah. Right. Music is one. And there's been a number of studies that show music and language help the brain in all areas. You take a game like Lumosity or one of these brain trainers, it makes you really good at fucking brain trainers. Yeah. It makes you really good at that. doesn't make you good at all things. Whereas language and music does. Yeah. Well, and, and, then, and they have, they have versatility as well. Yeah. Like you, it, the playing a drum is like getting into a meditative state. Like, and even piano is like, that's pr- your problem solving. Essentially, there's so much. Level. Yeah. There's so much to that. And I got a podcast coming up with Parangi talking about the, what we've lost in our tribal setting is not just the rite of passage. It's the original TV screen. The original form of entertainment was the campfire. And we all sang. <laughs> yeah. We all danced. We all played the drum. We all fucking moved to the beat. Mm-hmm. And that's inherent in all of us. Even if yeah. you're white, it all fucking goes back to the, to the original origins of humanity. And that's something that we can tap back into, you know? And I fucking have two left feet, but I still feel better when I try, yeah. you know? So that's something I want to give to him. And then martial arts, not because I want him to be a fighter or run the same path that I did. I didn't do martial arts when I was younger. I got into wrestling, which is a form of that, but it's the idea that there's, there's, and again, he can, if he hates wrestling, he sign up for the year. He can get into jujitsu the next year. If he wants to play basketball, football, baseball, any real sports, real sports, yeah. he can do those sports and not do martial arts in the season. But once he's out of season, he's going right back into his martial art. Yeah. Right, because the kids that I knew growing up that that were a black belt in Taekwondo, even if they didn't know how to successfully defend themselves, they didn't have a chip on their shoulder. Yeah, they weren't testing people like a fucking bully who'd been beat by his dad. Yeah, that guy's got a chip on his shoulder for a reason. He wants to take out his pain and anger on other people. The black belts didn't get bullied. They never got bullied, but more than that, they didn't bully others because they didn't have that chip on the sh- they didn't they have need a need to. for it, yeah. right? They were testing themselves constantly and it ma- it brings a level of peace and contentment that not many things can give young people. Yeah, I think I'm 100% with you there, man. And the diversity in sports too, you learn so much. Like even I wish I going back, like I wish I would have done something different than just football, but football by itself like gave me such a sense of community and you feel valued on a team too and you feel valued when you're capable and you see you start to to understand what success is like with your body and with mm-hmm. your mind and overcoming yourself and getting it getting out of your own way like there's so much there but the music dude i mean the, when it comes to music like that's something that i think is underutilized really like if we just talk about just playing the drum like I played percussion when I was in junior high and I'm actually really grateful for that even though it was like the band experience was kind of funky but like just being able to play a drum and like I really fucking enjoyed that and it's something I let with that and art are two things I did when I was young and the football just like took consumed my life mm-hmm. but it was it felt so free 
just to like play the drum by myself in my room, just do the thing, you know? And even now it's like, we do drum circles as a family and it's like, those are some of the best, those are the best moments ever just cause you get to get to commune and commune in that, in that arena. It's awesome. Yeah, And I think in, in both those avenues, whether it's martial arts or music, you're tapping into something that is inherently in, embedded in us from an evolutionary <laughs> standpoint. Well, fuck, dude. <laughs> on my, uh, I've talked about this on the podcast several times, my Vilka experience in Peru. Um, I was playing the drums on my chest. It was so wild and people thought it was funny because they could hear me outside the room and I, my chest was all red, but I was called into a Native American ceremony and that was like what we were doing. We were just playing, we were playing music together. It was such a, it was the craziest, most beautiful trip of my entire life, right? Even like had a child and, and was able to raise a child through like a peaceful, loving, compassionate way of, of leadership and, and essentially ended up with like a peaceful warrior. And that way it was incredible. But the, the, the ceremony was all around this music and calling and coming together. It was, it was wild. And that sounds pretty fucking crazy because it was pretty fucking crazy. But after ever, ever since that moment, I felt like more called to, to play. Yeah. I felt that over time, one of the lasting impressions that I get in many ceremonies, the more the, the more ceremonies I've done with true Shipibo shaman who play a multitude of instruments. Like this dude played a fucking harmonica. It was the first time he had seen a harmonica in his entire life. He had heard of a harmonica, never seen one. Shipibo, you said? He, yeah. He yeah. ripped that fucking harmonica like the best pro musician I've ever heard in my life. And <laughs> my I, blues traveler on that shit? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Like it was just fucking mind blowing to hear a harmonica that way. He could play any instrument that way. Yeah. And that was like, oh fuck, like when you tap into that, when you when you realize the music's coming from within, it doesn't matter what the fucking tool is, you're going to play it right. Yeah. Like that's where I want to get. I want to have that, yeah. you know. And and I'm very much, you know, having my son learn these things. I'm going to be fucking sitting right next to him like, <laughs> let me fucking learn piano with you. That's the best thing about learn kids, you get to learn from them. <laughs> yeah. He's my greatest teacher. Yeah. That's something I got um when Bear was in the womb, I was down in uh, Panama, the tribal gathering. And I got to speak to him while he was in my wife's womb. And I realized after the vision, like he will be my greatest teacher. That's awesome. Hands man. down. I believe that he teaches me a lot. Our little hangouts. Uncle Connor. <laughs> 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 well, full, uh, it's one of the, well, actually probably one of my favorite things, if not yeah, it's up to up there to 2017 is taking on the uncle Connor role. That's been so fun, man, with your kids and Cal's kids and just like, just getting to hang out. Like that's something I've had. I've always had that in me, like that fatherly uncle type, type vibe. And it's, uh, it's been super cool to see Barrett. And even in the, well, I've known him for six, eight months now. And it's like, he's grown up so much and he's talking more and he started calling me uncle Connor, which was like my little heart exploded. <laughs> yeah. He cries for you when you, when you uh, leave after babysitting, he'll fucking lay, I'll lay him down for naps. And we, we always say like, good night, mama. Good night, bear. Good night, daddy. And he goes, good night, uncle Connor. <laughs> and you'll cry. <laughs> okay, I just said, uncle that, made me, that made me so happy. I fucking love it. <laughs> but man, I think I love how tangential this podcast is. We, that started about books. <laughs> that's right well tell me what your fucking dope book of the Dude, year was it, it's gonna be a little different Gene than Keys, yours. richard rudd Gene write Keys. that shit down write it down right now stop the podcast write it down okay on to the next one it's got to be the subtle art of not giving a fuck man that book mark manson the way he wrote it the way he put it together See, it was so relatable to me here's it what i have trouble mind. with i may end up having to get that book but here's what I have trouble with, and this made me come across as snooty or or I don't want it to come across as I figured it all out. But I was talking with Matt Vincent about this. Uh, the book, um, The Obstacle is the Way. Yeah. It's like, okay, I think that would be a great message for a lot of people, but I'm fucking light years past this. Like there's nothing that's been worded in this book that – I need to hear again, like, like the, you talk about learning like your diet, right? You yeah. don't need to figure out what you're going to fucking shop for. Yeah. Right. I read prime, the, the keto reset just to see what the latest, greatest shit was on keto. Not because I fucking need new information on keto. I know how to do it. I've lived it. Right. So the, you get to a point where you're just like, Oh, I, I do these things for me. Not because, because they're my favorite thing to do, but because I know I need them because they serve me well. Yeah. And that long term pleasure is there because of the fucking choices that I make every day, right? So I don't have a problem sitting. I was in the fucking infrared sauna here 
30 minutes in and I'm trying to fucking listen to this book on Audible and I was like, fuck man, I'm already on cold bass. I'm already doing all this shit. I'm already on the mats. I'm already, I've yeah. fought in front of fucking 20,000 people. Like I get it, you know? So I, I wonder how much the subtle art of not giving a fuck would shift my consciousness. Yeah. So that's actually a really good question. And I felt the same way about the alchemist. Right, so someone gave me the Alchemist. Gave, have you read that book before? I've heard of it. I haven't read it. So it's it's one of the most popular, like I would say, like spiritual awakening books out there. And I read it probably two years ago, and I was incredibly disappointed because I, mm. I read that I was twenty pages in, and I go, if this thing ends the way I think it's going to end, I've, I've got this message, and I had, and it was I was really I was bummed. I mean, I read yeah. it, and I finished it. And it was it's a good book, and in in at the beginning of someone's path, I think that's really important. I do try to keep. I like to remind myself of, <laughs> I like to remind myself of what's relatable and how people are articulating things. So for me, I, ge- I geek out on like language is my currency, I would say. Yeah. So the way that someone that I respect, like Mark Manson and how he, how he can articulate his message and that, that adds a lot of value to me. So I, looked, mm-hmm. I do view it through that lens, but it was, it was things that are ever present that are almost running in the background. He brought awareness to those. And in a way, and, and he articulated it in a way that was so receivable. And depending on where you're at, like there was a message in there for what I would believe everybody. Like if you have no idea what the, where you're fucking lost, you read that book, it's going to give you some clarity. If you have some guidance, you kind of know where you're at, you know where you want to go. It's going gonna, it's gonna to give you some clarity. It's going to meet you where you are. And that was one of the most powerful things about the book. And just the guy's story and how he came about. And his story, is really, he's a really cool dude, but he's, he's just a guy. He's just yeah. a fucking guy. And he, he, he developed his art through just writing, writing all the time. And he, he reached a point where he was just kind of fed up with his life. He started as a dating consultant and, and his team, his, he geeks out on human behavior, which is really my, what scratches the itch for me. But that, just that book. And I think it was just how it was delivered. Mm. I didn't, it gave me faith in, in my message, honestly. And maybe that's why I love it so much because he delivered it in such a lighthearted way, but it packed such a punch that I realized, oh, I can, I can do this. Like that's what I'm doing. I like I, this podcast is 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 funny, entertaining. I hope uh, if you're listening to it an hour and a half in right now, I fucking hate it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 you know. But we're also talking about you and I are sitting here talking about pretty you know, esoteric concepts that are out there that we could deliver. We could sit over here and circle jerk and like and, and just have a, a pissing contest, right? Like some podcasts do talk about how how. Let's just have a contest on how smart we are and how much we know versus trying to can have a conversation that people can relate to and be empowered by. And that's really what I got out of that book. It was, and it's an easy read. It's super fun. And it just, it, I laughed and cried in it. And if I can laugh, if I could laugh and cry in a book, like that's something that, that doesn't happen often. And I look, through, I look at them through a very critical lens. So that, yeah, that, uh, that book really, it changed the way I view things. I need to read it again, actually. I'll add it to the audible. We it's an easy one, read. You one get, credit on the 15th. I want to hear what you have to say about it. We should yeah. do, a, do a book review I'll again. I'll do it. I fucking, fly, you know, I, I finally got a custom. I know you millennials have been into this for a while, but <laughs> listening to Audible on 2X. I can't do two. One, 1. 1.25 is as far as I've gotten. Really? Dude, I don't. Man, I don't. All the kids are into fucking one. They're like 1.5 so slow. So for a spiritual book like like Mastery I listen to on Audible, I listen to that at 1.5. Sometimes at the one book point of mastery two, by Paul Selig or mastery by Robert Green. No, Paul, but Paul Selig. The book okay. Of mastery. There's a lot of mastery books out there. That's true. Uh, I follow Robert Green. I think I've read mastery, but no, the, the Paul Selig book is what I was talking about. Yeah. And, and it is quite repetitive, but in a good way. Yeah. So I think it's important to take breaks from it. It's like yeah. if I take a week long break and kind of contemplate the concepts and circle back, I f- it felt like it had more meaning. I did that book like 30 minutes at a time. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> man, fucking, I finally got to two X listen to keto reset and I fucking digested all of it. And I did learn some new shit. So I think like, uh, that'll open up some doors with how fast I can grind through shit because I'm still impressed by fucking Ben Greenfield reading seven books a week. And he didn't, t- I asked him if he took like the Jim quick, you've heard of Jim quick. Yeah. Jim Quick, his last name is actually K-W-I-K, but he teaches courses on speed reading, oddly enough, ironically. And uh, this dude's fucking all about speed reading. And I was like, did you take one of Jim Quick's courses? And he was like, no, I just fucking, he's like a self-taught, but he, he does read seven books a week consistently. That's crazy. And he, and he, and obviously you listen to the guy talk. Yeah. He processes all that information. Exactly. Like some people can glance through shit and like, yeah, I got the basic concept, but... And he'll tell, you know, Ben will tell me, he's a buddy, he'll tell me like which book he skimmed and didn't like really resonate with him versus which one's like a must read. Yeah. But, um, 
yeah, I he has two twin boys, you know. So that's the other thing is like, all right, there's no excuses. I, I'm allowed to read when I'm at work. I, I can read when I'm on walks. I can I can get new information in, and and I need to get new information in to have new concepts, new ideas, and open up my experience, right? Yep. Open up my perspective. So it's important to me. That said, uh, it's very hard to fucking get all that done while you have a nine to five and a kid and, and a wife and yeah. all the shit that you got to do. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I think it'll be helpful to fucking try to grind through some books at two X and see what I can retain from it. Well, I think it forces you to pay attention to. That's one thing I thought about. Cause I'm like, I don't really want to listen to these books on, on, I don't want to speed them up and I'm trying to get to where I can do one and a half. Cause it forces me to listen. If, if someone's talking slow, like if I listen to an Eckhart Tolle book, it just, I'd rather just read it because he's yeah. talking. So, and I, and I quit quit paying attention because it i'll, I'll drift off because this is not i kind of like i've enough. listened to that book a number of times and i like the slowness i like the you know when you have someone on uh even on a podcast who they're gonna pause and i'm not i'm not i'm drawing a blank here i'm not fucking pausing <laughs> for effect but the, when they pause or when they when they give like you know little influxes in their voice it's with purpose and meaning especially if it's the actual author reading it not just some fucking hollywood quack way different way different game way different game right so i don't mind slowing it down for those but i think for the bulk of knowledge that i'm trying to bring in you know certainly you can't be done with gene keys you got to have a physical copy of that but for other books you know i think i think the 2x is the way to go yeah i feel you there that's the fucking move son well shit man that's 2017 what uh what's on deck for you for 2018 what's your intention going into that bitch man my intention is to continue to work with the plants as i feel called to them uh i've had some transformative experiences this year and i think that there's more work to be done in that realm uh, more lessons to be learned and more growth. Uh, I have an intention with my wife to have better communication on my end, to be less emotionally drawn into um, an argument, you know, to embody the four agreements, to not take things personally when uh, she's upset specifically. And this is, you know, not me fucking tattletailing or anything like that. It's my work to do that. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and I think with my son exercising more patience and being the gentle father, you know, I had a, I had an aboga experience, my only aboga experience, and everything I've read on that is that it's just fucking ruthless for 24 to 36 hours, and agonizing pain, fevers, shitting everywhere, throwing throwing up, and just it's a very harsh teacher, and it was honestly an easier experience than any ayahuasca experience mm-hmm. I've ever had. One of the easiest experiences I've ever had going deep, even among psilocybin experiences. And in a way, I think it was showing me like, not only can I be a gentle teacher, but so can you, <laughs> you know, like this is, this is that fatherly energy of a boga. And it's, a, it's, there's a way for me, Kyle Kingsbury to embody that as a parent, to be a gentle teacher and to still have the masculine, but not to be forceful, not to fucking my way or the highway and not to to speak and react out of anger, but to do through love and gentleness and to, to be present and to allow, you know, those other emotions. Cause ultimately everybody has their own fucking bag of emotions. You yep. know what I'm saying? But that I'm not tied to those, you know, and that's something for me to remember. And I'm saying this authoritatively because <laughs> it's a big lesson for me. Yeah. You know, it's been a big lesson for me this year. And I think going into next year, really, you know, as, as Paul check says, you can read every fucking book in the world, but if you don't embody that knowledge, it's worthless. Yep. You're the guy with all the facts, right? So my goal for 20, one of my big goals for 2018 is to embody as much of this knowledge as I can, because I've read a decent amount and there's no, there's no end to how many books I'll read, you know, because I have people telling me, Hey, you got to read this one. Or, you know, yeah. somebody gives me this one, or we got a new guest in town for the on it podcast and I got to fucking read their book. So there will be more and more, you know, uh, knowledge coming in, but it's not wisdom until I embody that. So that. that's a big one for me. I like that, man. That's good. You know, for, for me on my end, it comes down to really, this 2017 was a year where I let a lot of things in. I let a lot of things in. I got pulled in a lot of different directions. And one thing that's come through in the work that I've done is really being relentless, compassionate, but relentless with what I let into my life. It, it has to be in alignment with the mission. Like <laughs> the tracks have to fit the train. And that's something that feels so fucking good. Just saying that. 
just saying that and using those words, using that language, and then really coming through and understanding how much I create and going into it. It's different for me. It's very much different for me because I, I have this kind of easygoing persona that I really enjoy, but there's comes a time to like really to draw a line in the sand. And dude, that has been a fucking struggle because all I want is to just to do for everyone. And I've been doing that. And, you know, I had that realization coming through and I didn't bring this up when we talked about the, the mushroom ceremony that we did, but that I had been told my whole life that I was selfish. I've been told my whole life that I was an asshole, right? So I, the reflection of that was me sacrificing myself constantly. Like I wanted to just give to people to prove to whoever had told me that when I was a child, I was eight years old. People were telling me I'm selfish. Something you had agreed on. Yeah. Right. right? Yeah. And I, so I'm like, well, I'll fuck you. I'll show you how, how, how not selfish I am. Right. And I, and that's let, honestly, I'm grateful for that. Right. I found gratitude in that because it led me to this where right? I do want to give, but I have to, I have to understand what fuels me and what I need in my life. And dude, I just want some fucking stability. I want some stability in my wanderings. Cause the thing about it is in me, and I also saw this in the mushroom trip, which again, thank you so much for inviting me into that and, and having that with me. But that the nature of the beast with me is that I'm going to get a little bit lost. I'm going to let myself lose ground and go and wander and find and get, get torn up and then share those experiences. Like my life is a process of creating experience. And because I do really enjoy being vulnerable and sharing and sharing those with people and putting that out there, that's a gift. That's my gift. And realizing that, allowing that, and then bringing the connections and the energy into my life that fuels that, fuck man, that, that, that gets me excited. Are you going to change your IG handle from Connor Wanders to Connor Stabilities? <laughs> Connor Wanders, I think, is, is, is a staple. I'm still going to wander. I just want to, I want, that's the thing is having stability in the wandering, right? It's like yeah. I'm consciously going in and like, I'm, I'm, I'm going in. Mm. I'm going in to create an experience. I say yes to almost fucking everything now. <laughs> but I do it from a place of, of giving. You know, and that's, and it's time. And in some ways I'm like, it's time for me to, to receive, you know, receive and then, and use what I'm receiving to give more. And that's all I've ever really want. And if I, if I really unpack my life, that's all I really ever wanted. That's what I feel like has been missing. And I feel like I'm ready to take that on, which is fuck, man. That's like I said, it feels good. Hell yeah. We're in fucking, we're in a great spot heading into 2018. (laughs) That's for damn sure, brother. Bring that shit on, dude. Well, it's been, uh, it's been a hell of a year, man. I'm grateful to have you in my life. And, um, let's talk a little bit about what you're doing with on it podcast and where people can find you. Yeah, man. I'm, uh, at, at Kingsboo, K I N G S B U on Twitter and Instagram. I'm on Facebook too, but my friends are maxed out because they capped that at 5,000. And I said yes to everyone when I was a fighter. Uh, <laughs> you did constant need for validation. So I can't, a fighter. Well, no, I was trying to build a following, you know, and then I was like, Oh, they actually capped this. Yeah. They're like, Oh yeah. You're, you're supposed to create a fan page. And then I get like fucking 300 people that click like on the fan page. And I'm like, fuck <laughs> this shit. And I'm off Facebook. I'm done with it. But twi- you, got a, you got a great Twitter following. Twitter. Though. Yeah. Twitter, Twitter's the shit. Twitter's great. Cause it's short. You don't get people bitching too much. If they do, they got to do well, 280 characters now. <laughs> and then, uh, Instagram's cool, you know, uh, fucking like going on both of those. I'm trying to do a better job of posting more. You know, I post few and far between on that because um, through on it, I'm working on the biohack of the week and different fun stuff mm-hmm. that we get to do, shit that I'm doing, optim- how I optimize my desk. I got a fucking altitude machine there, the Indo board. <laughs> you got the weirdest All this, desk ever. Yeah, man, just fun, <laughs> fun shit. Make it your fucking playground, yeah. you know. But um, yeah, man, we've had some fucking excellent guests on the on it podcast. Um, I'm really excited for what we do with in 2018. You know, I mean, this has been fucking three months of podcasts and we've already had, you know, it's a lot of guys on my bucket list and we've got a lot more coming through town that um, it's going to be a fucking great year with that podcast. I think it's gained a lot of ground. I'm going to start submitting requests for guests, by the way. Oh, from me? For, yeah. You can get Chris Ryan here. He's got a book coming out. That's an excuse. Hey, dude. Well, we're getting Chris Ryan here. We're going to get him on for okay. damn sure. So yeah. so consider the the, requ- the request has been noted, brother. <laughs> I'll tell him. We got we got three podcasts for you. AMP, On It, and uh, Pleasure Monkey. No, we're going. I'm, so I have, I have a goal with Chris Ryan is that I want to have a podcast. Me, him, and just two babes. <laughs> and then I also I also want to get I want to get two me, babes just two babes and just go into because he's he's just he's such a charismatic goofball it's fucking hilarious he's my podcast hero I'm gonna put that out there I'm gonna yeah. geek out. he won't listen to this show probably so I'll put that out there but uh, and I think me me you him and Aubrey if you guys want to see me Chris Ryan <laughs> Aubrey and Kyle on one podcast we gotta get that laid down too yeah he's he's fucking 
He's amazing, dude. He's a fucking great guy. Interesting cat. For sure. Yeah, lots of lots of good shit coming up. But yeah, look me up on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, listen to the fucking On It podcast. As you do with the Pleasure Monkey, leave us all a fucking five-star review. It helps people find the show. <laughs> helps spread the love if you like it. And if you don't, you know, like what is that saying? Uh, if you don't have anything nice to say, then 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 don't say it. Don't say anything at all. <laughs> had, That's right. I had, I had a... I had a Twitter troll, or not a Twitter troll, just an MMA troll from fighting, uh, left me a one-star review on Current Space way back in the day and said, Kyle Kingsbury is un-American. <laughs> that was what he wrote. <laughs> I was like, like clearly. I've got, I've got one one-star review. I've got like 90 reviews, all of our five stars, one one-star. Yeah, you're going to get, yeah, dude, you, it, you live around long enough, you get a couple one-stars, but... But that's the whole deal, you that's know. That's part of it. I thought it was funny. If you're not, yeah, un-American, I, I like. I don't that. know if it's un-American. Like, it's a way, but yeah, dude, yeah, give a review. If, you, if you're checking out the Audit Podcast, go give Kyle a review. That's shit. That shit makes my day. I check it all the time. I just love what hear people have to say. Okay. I love what you have to say, man. Thank you so much. Come on, the show. We'll see you probably later today. Yeah, we're brother. Fucking bros. Yeah, bro. <laughs> Peace, man. Hope you love that show, everybody. Kyle Kingsbury is one of a kind. Love that guy so much. <laughs> he won't leave me alone but here we are guys if you love the show make sure like we said in the episode go to itunes give it a five-star review go check out kyle and the on it podcast on itunes and if you want to support what we got going on you can go get some sweet gear from our friends over at hate brand goods that's h-v-i-i it's the hate.com and you're gonna get 15 percent off with code word monkey we also brought up the power of language now my buddy mark england over at procabulary has put together a language upgrade course and if you use code word monkey at procabulary that's pro p-r-o cabulary.org you're gonna get 99 dollars off of that course Bam, it will change the game going into 2018. Do not sleep on that, guys. The way you talk to other people, the way you talk to yourself is so powerful. It can absolutely change everything about the way you view yourself and the way you carry yourself. And I want the best for you in 2018. Also, if you feel like working with me one-on-one, finding those values, getting rid of that unnecessary bullshit, go to PleasureMonkeyLife.com, hit the Lifestyle Design tab, and fill out a short few questions. And then we're going to sit, uh, set up a 30-minute free call just to dive into your life and see if you want to embark on the eight-week lifestyle design program. That is it for me. Hope you love this show. Love you guys. Y'all have an awesome week. I'm so stoked to be going into 2018 with y'all. And uh, let's fucking do it. Much love. Peace.